Hello and welcome to the SFMTA Budget Online Town Hall. We are streaming this via our website, sfmta.com backslash budget, and on our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages. We're also live on SFGov TV channel 26. My name is Carolyn Odoms and I'll be your host tonight. With me is the Director of Transportation, Ed Riskin. Our goal today is to give some background information on the budget and the process that helps us create it. Hopefully this will shed some light on our priorities as an agency and let you know where our goals are. We'll also be answering questions from the community, so please chime in on SFMTA social media by emailing sfmtabudget at sfmta.com. We will try to answer as many of these questions as we can the second half of our broadcast. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. I'm a native of San Francisco, hailing from the Bayview. I have a background in marketing, communications, and customer service. I was guided to SFMTA by my father, Jerry Odoms, and my uncle, Robert Green, who have over 60 combined years with the company. I began as an operator, driving the 1, 30, 30 and 45, and then I went on to trains, and I've driven the LKMNN. I'm currently a supervisor at, uh, and I've supervised our construction sites, uh, street operations, and I am currently a supervisor at our Metro Green Division. I oversee the morning operations of the KL and M lines. I'm a mother of two and an avid traveler. Also a 49ers fan, and I'll go with the Golden State Warriors. Uh, <laughs> so, now we're gonna move on to Ed. Ed, can you tell us a little bit about your day? Sure, so the uh, position I hold is established in the charter as the Director of Transportation for the City and County of San Francisco, which gives me the great privilege of leading the SFMTA, uh, which is, you know, is an agency that has a broad responsibility for planning and engineering transportation in the city, managing parking and traffic, bike and pedestrian safety, regulating the taxis, and of course, uh, managing and operating Muni. Uh, so with that uh, breadth of activities, I spend a lot of my day meeting with a lot of different people. Uh, I meet with my staff on a regular basis to get caught up on what's happening and provide direction in terms of moving the agency forward. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, meeting with folks from other departments. Um, there's uh, very little work that we do at the MTA that doesn't uh, interact with or rely on the work of other departments, whether it's public works or planning or the Public Utilities Commission. So there's a lot of interagency coordination that I spend my time doing. I spend some time here at City Hall meeting with the elected and appointed officials uh, to make sure that we're being responsive to the people uh, who have elected them and that they represent. And I, I try to spend as much time as possible also out in the field uh, seeing the, the work uh, happening, talking to our employees out in the field, um, as well as talking to other stakeholders, the business community, neighborhood groups, uh, other stakeholders, so that I can get a, a good sense of the job. I also, uh, my family and I live in the city, and so when I'm not working, I'm still uh, on the bus, on the train, riding my bike, walking, even sometimes driving in the city. So I, f I feel like I'm also somewhat immersed in the job even, even when I'm not working. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty much what I do. And uh, a big part of the job is developing the budget <clears throat> every two years. Well, thanks for that. Before we get to questions, let's start off with an overview about the SFMTA budget and describes what it means for the city of San Francisco. Okay, happy to do that. So I have some slides going to use to guide the conversation a little bit. The, it, it is a large agency, and the, the budget can be a little bit uh, complex. So I'm glad that we only have to do it every two years. Um, but it's, it's obviously an important part of what we do because the budget is really what frames a lot of the activity that we do uh, over the course uh, of the years. So the 
to start out with, to, just to give a sense of the, the scope and scale of the agency, <clears throat> in, in rough numbers, we have a $1.1 billion operating budget, so that's the money we spend every year, and a $3.6 billion five-year capital program. Those are the investments that we're making over time to improve the system. Uh, you can see from the slide uh, some different numbers to give you a sense of scale. On an average weekday, we're providing more than 700 rides. Um, we've got more than 280,000 street signs. We have 28,000 parking meters. Um, coming up on 500 miles of bike paths, lanes, and routes, a number that's, that's growing every day. We have more than 1,200 signalized intersections. Uh, the agency is authorized for more than 6,000 employees now. So uh, this uh, is just to give a sense of the, the scale and the breadth of the agency and the, somewhat the complexity of what we have to manage. So what, what guides the development of the budget, our operating decisions, the actions we're taking on a day-to-day -day basis, the policies we recommend are, are, is our strategic plan. Uh, what this shows is the vision and the four goals of the strategic plan that was adopted by the SFMTA Board of Directors back in 2012. Um, and, and this is what we use to govern our work. And, and I should uh, note that I report to the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors are appointed by the Board of Supervisors after being nominated by the mayor, and they are the ones that set the policy for the agency. And that policy is articulated in the strategic plan, uh, which those goals reflect, and that really guides the work that we do in the agency and guides us as we go to think about how to develop the budget uh, for every, which we do every two years. So, so just some context um, as we think about developing a budget, uh, we're thinking about what are the trends that are happening in San Francisco. Um, so some things that are going on, uh, one very positive one is when we look at the uh, trend in terms of fatalities on our streets. These are people who are trying to get around San Francisco and are being killed in the process. Uh, while we're not, well, <clears throat> the agency adopted a, a goal and a policy of Vision Zero, which is to eliminate traffic fatalities in San Francisco, and that was a recognition that we are no longer accepting the fact that people, we should expect every year that people are gonna die in our streets. Uh, but the fact is that they do, and we're working hard to, to get to zero. And what's encouraging, what you can see on the chart, is that we are experiencing a continuing downward trend uh, last year, in fact, we had the fewest people die on the streets since we started counting the statistic back in 1915. So in more than 100 years, the lowest number we've ever had. Um, and we're hopeful that that's a result in part of the adoption of Vision Zero and us working together uh, with the leadership of the mayor and the board of supervisors, with the other city agencies, and more, most importantly, with our community partners and the public at large uh, to all embrace the notion that while people may make mistakes out on the street, uh, they shouldn't give their lives for it. So we, we continue to drive that number down and, and safety on the streets is a big part of what this agency does. Uh, so that's an encouraging trend. Another encouraging trend, if we can go, I think, back a slide. Um, okay, that was back a slide. So an, another trend that we're facing, and uh, you as a, a San Franciscan uh, would probably be recognizing this uh, as much as anyone else, is that the city's growing uh, very rapidly. Uh, just uh, since 2000, we've added nearly 100,000 people to the population of San Francisco. And if you project forward to the year 2040, uh, we're anticipating, or the, the I guess the demographers are, are anticipating, we're gonna have about 1.1 million people here in, in our little city of San Francisco. So the fact that the population continues to grow and what we do is provide transportation service for the people in San Francisco, both the folks that live here, but also the folks that come here to work and come here to visit uh, is, a, is a very relevant for us as we think about developing the budget and figuring out the level of service that we need to provide. So uh, another trend that's uh, positive has to do with muni service and this is something you can appreciate and maybe you're responsible for for this good news at least in part um, and that is when the the voters put this agency together 
back in by changing the charter back in 99, putting together Muni and the Department of Parking and Traffic DPT. One of the things they asked us to do, um, the, the purpose of putting the agency together was to manage parking and traffic to make Muni operate better. And so one of the things that they tasked the agency with doing is asking our Muni riders, how are we doing relative to that goal of making Muni better? Uh, so we've been doing that every year or two since. And what this graph shows is that in the most uh, recent years, uh, we've hit an all-time high of 70% of riders surveyed, indicating the service was uh, very good, good or very good. Um, and so, so that's also a, a positive trend and one that we want to continue building on. So th th those are just some, some context points in terms of um, how we start thinking about the budget. So if from a fiscal perspective, as we're thinking about the budget, uh, there's two sides of the ledger, right? There's the revenues, that's the money coming into the agency that we have to spend, and then there's the expenditures, that's how we're spending the money. And the general trend that we're seeing right now is that our revenues are somewhat flat, whereas uh, as our expenditures are growing. The revenues are uh, supported by the city's general fund, the, the charter is set up so that we get a, a portion of the city's general fund revenue. So when the city economy is doing well and those revenues are flowing into the general fund, they then by formula flow into our agency and that obviously has been strong during this period of economic growth. Uh, but at the same time, some of our other revenue sources such as our parking revenues and even our muni transit fare revenues have been flat or declining. So putting that all together, uh, we're seeing our revenues uh, they're, they're growing, but they're growing very slowly. Uh, th this chart actually gives you a sense of where the revenues come from. Um, and you can see wh what's good is that we have a pretty diversified source of revenues. A lot of uh, other agencies, particularly transit agencies, don't have this, uh, this diversity. Uh, so there's a big chunk from the general fund. There's a big chunk from parking and traffic. Uh, there's a big chunk from transit fares. And then there are some grants that we get uh, from the state and other sources. Um, so while the general fund uh, portion of that pie has remained strong, the uh, transit fares and the parking revenues have, have flattened or are slightly declining. So the revenues aren't growing that quickly. Meanwhile, the expenditures are growing at a faster rate than the revenues are growing. And that's driven by a number of factors. Uh, it's driven largely by our labor costs, the, the, those 6,000 people who do a great job delivering Muni service and all the other service that we provide each day. Uh, we need to pay them, and they're trying to keep up with cost of living, and we're trying to keep up with their cost of living. And so what we've negotiated with them in terms of their wages, um, as well as their health benefits and pension costs, and, and everybody knows in this country health care costs are rising faster than inflation, that drives our expenditures up. So our expenditures are growing a little bit faster than our revenues, which means we've got a little bit of a gap to close. Uh, you can see from the chart, just for, so that folks can get a sense of the agency, how the, uh, how the expenditures are allocated. Muni is obviously the, big, uh, the biggest part of the budget. It, it's, the, it's the lion's share of the budget. Uh, the, the other divisions uh, together uh, come up, um, comprise less than half. Uh, but all of them are working largely in support of Muni and supporting the, the safety on our streets. So the, with, with that starting point, that's just taking what we're doing today. And it shows with revenues growing a little bit slower than expenditures, we've got a little bit of a gap to close. But because of the growth of the city, there's actually more that we're trying to do than just what we're doing today. As, as I'm sure you know, uh, working on out of Metro Rail, we're putting new train cars into service. And those aren't replacement for the old train cars, those are additions to the existing train fleet. Uh, we're doing that because as anyone who rides the metro knows, uh, our trains are largely crowded or overcrowded. So we're trying to get more trains on the lines to accommodate the demand for, for rail service. So we should, these new cars that, that we've got, I think four of them out on the streets as we speak, we'll have uh, 24 of them by by the fall, we'll have an, another 40 by the end of next year. So that's 64 additional rail cars in service in San Francisco um, they, they, that are gonna help people move around, uh, but that's gonna cost money to put all those cars in service. So we, we need to account for that. Um, we have the central subway 
that will be opening at the end of 2019. Uh, getting the central subway into service is uh, also to meet additional demand and the, going north-south on the eastern side of the city is going to cost some money. And as you may know, we're opening, as we've added a lot of bus service recently, uh, adding more buses to the fleet and replacing shorter buses with longer buses, we've run out of space at our bus facilities. So we're also opening a new bus division this summer at, at Islaus Creek that's going to cost some money. So we're going to have to figure out how to work within our budget, how to tighten our belt within the existing budget so that we can free up revenues so that we can do those extra things to deliver more service to, to the people of San Francisco. One other thing but before I close so that we can get to questions that I just wanted to note is that one of the major things that we do each year, each two years when we're establishing the budget, is we're looking at transit fares as well as all the fees and uh, fines that are part of the agency's responsibility. Generally speaking, uh, by a policy that was set by the board back in 2009, uh, we have a formula by which we index those fares to keep up with inflation so that we don't fall behind. Um, and so generally we, we, we'd be proposing to do that, but there's a few categories of muni fares that we're looking at that we, we might deviate from that indexing a little bit. And just a, a couple of examples and ones that I think would be of interest to the public. Uh, one of them is that right now a, a single ride fare on Muni costs $2.50. If you're paying with a Clipper card or using Muni Mobile, our app, it's two seventy-five dollars if you're paying in cash. The indexing proposal would have them both go up by a quarter. Um, but what we're thinking about proposing is keeping the single ride fare for people using Muni Mobile or Clipper at $2.50 um, and letting the other one index up to $3. So we, we actually create a, a larger differential, a greater incentive to get more people using a Clipper card or using Muni Mobile uh, because processing cash is expensive. Cash at the fare box slows down the boarding process. So it's better for all riders if we can get more folks uh, off of cash. That's one example. Uh, another example that we're thinking about doing is actually adding a new fare product, which would be a one-day pass that would be available on Muni Mobile um, that maybe would be the cost of two or two and a half times a Muni fare. But maybe for infrequent riders, people who may not have a Clipper card but may want to take more rides in a day, we want to provide incentive for folks to, to use transit because the, whether you ride Muni often, sometimes, or never, the more people that get on Muni, the better it is for everyone else because it leaves more room for people who are choosing or wanting to drive or to ride a bike or walk. The more people we get on Muni, the better. So we try to use our fare policy to encourage people to ride Muni. That's why we have the free Muni programs for low and moderate income youth and seniors and pe people with disabilities. We have a half price Muni program for low income adults. Uh, a lot of our fare policy is really drived at equity and about getting more people onto Muni. So those are some of the things that we're thinking about as we're trying to develop this next budget. Uh, we're coming towards the end of the budget development process, uh, getting feedback from a forum such as this mm -hmm. uh, and other public hearings we've had, other public meetings we have is a big part of what informs the budget. So we're, we're, the charter requires, uh, requires us to submit every, on every even year a balanced budget to City Hall by May 1st. So here we are at the beginning of March. Uh, we have uh, this meeting. We'll be going back to our board uh, one more time this month, and then we'll be proposing a first balance budget to the MTA Board of Directors in April. Uh, they'll, if, if they like it, they can approve it and pass it along. If they don't, they can send me back to the drawing board, and I'll have another chance to bring back a, the, the budget. But we're getting close to the, to the end here, and the, the feedback that we get from a forum like this is really important, so really looking forward to the questions. Thank you. That was very interesting, and we appreciate you sharing that. Okay, as promised, let's move on to some questions. First, we've, we've been presenting this uh, budget to various shareholders and uh, sharing it with a lot of community groups. Throughout that process, we've received a number of interesting questions. So let's go through some of these, and uh, I think it'll be helpful. So the first question is, uh, how, does the, how does this budget balance the needs of everyone who gets around the city? 
So that's a great question. That's really core to the work uh, of this agency. Um, <clears throat> we are the, the city's transportation department. I am the, the director of transportation, and uh, it's my job and our job to facilitate people getting around the city, no matter how they choose to get around the city. Some people are taking Muni every day. Some people are never taking Muni. Some people are riding their bikes often. Some people are never getting on a bike. No matter how people get around, it's our job to facilitate them being able to get around and particularly to, to do so safely. Um, we, we do have in this uh, city a policy that's the transit first policy. It was adopted by the Board of Supervisors way back in 1973. And uh, that policy was a recognition that while the population may grow, and they probably could never have anticipated back in 1973 that we'd be talking about $1.1 million, right. uh, $1 million people in 2040, um, the city's not getting any bigger, and we need to accommodate uh, more and more people uh, with the, the streets that we have. Um, so back to what I was saying before, any ways that we can encourage people onto the more most efficient modes of transportation, which Muni represents, um, that's how we make space for those who do need to drive for delivery vehicles that need to serve our local businesses, particularly our small businesses. Um, the, we're trying to redesign the streets to make them work for everybody, maybe prioritizing transit on some streets, bicycling on some streets, driving on some streets. Um, that's the mix of what we have to do to make this work for everyone. Our capital budget has a lot of investments along those lines to make the streets safer and to make them work for all road users. What has the MTA done to control spending and contain costs? And how do city pension systems contribute the uh, effect of, uh, to the MT SFMTA budget? So those are really good questions too. I'll, I'll take the second one first. The, the pension costs uh, are not something that we control. They're actually essentially controlled by the voters. The, the pension system was established by the voters and can only be modified by the voters. Uh, the good thing is that during the, the Newsom and, and Lee administrations, there were a, a number of measures that were brought uh, to the ballot that were passed by San Franciscans to reform the pension system to try to make it for, more affordable. Uh, just today, San Francisco learned that it, became, it got its highest uh, bond rating ever, uh, which means that it's a reflection that the financial community believes that San Francisco is doing as good a job as it, as it can at managing liabilities, which, of which pension is a large one. So. P pension, uh, pension liability is one that does impact our budget. It's not one we can control, but I think the city and the voters of San Francisco have done a good job at that. In, in terms of uh, controlling our costs internally, um, it's something that we've spent a lot of time on and a, a way I think we're gonna get to balance with this budget is to be doing even more of that. Uh, we, we manage um, uh, all of our costs and our different operating groups at a at a number of different levels. Uh, we have a lot of data that we're able to track, uh, whether it's um, expenditures on materials, on equipment, expenditures on overtime. Um, there's a lot of things that we're tracking on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that we're operating as efficiently as possible. Uh, we have the city controller's office come in and evaluate how we're doing in various different business units, and we get recommendations from those audits. and many other audits that we're subject to, every single funding source that we have, whether it's the federal government, the state government, even our the local county transportation agency, they come in and audit us, and we use those audits and findings from those audits also to help us improve, to make sure that every dollar of public money that we have that we're treating preciously and spending as efficiently as we can. Why do we continue to pour money into things like streetscape improvements and other low usage mode shares, bicycles, when we have breakdowns of our city's most major transportation system? So that's a, that's a fair question. Uh, w with regard to uh, mode share, bicycling, bicycling is the fastest growing mode share in San Francisco, so it's the becoming the most, one of the more popular ways that people have to get around. And uh, whether we like them or not, uh, we need people, if people are gonna be bike, biking in the city, we want them to be able to do so safely. Uh, it's also a, a pretty efficient mode of transportation. It takes up very little space. 
most of the improvements that we do to make the streets safer, bicycles are uh, pretty low, relatively low cost. Um, and every person who's on a bicycle is someone who's maybe not in a car that's creating traffic or competing for a parking space. Um, and more generally with regard to streetscapes, uh, we want our streets to be inviting for people to walk in, to bike in, to drive on, to, to ride the bus through. Um, the public rights of way of San Francisco represent, uh, I think it's 25% of the land area of the city. Um, and so we don't want to think about them as just places for people to pass through. We want to think of them as places for people to be in. And the more inviting that we can make them for people to get around in different ways other than just uh, driving through in their automobile, uh, the more space there is for people who want or need to drive and the safer it is for everyone. So that's why we're making those investments. And I'd say we do so unapologetically. Very good. How do you incentivize new riders to ride instead of taking Uber or Lyft? And what is SFMTA doing to encourage ridership? Yeah, an, another great question. <clears throat> uh, so the good news is where as agency, transit agencies around this region and around the country really are seeing ridership decline, we're not seeing that on Muni, uh, which suggests that uh, Muni's offering a good value proposition to folks in terms of how to get around the city, thanks in part to the great work of uh, folks like you and, and your colleagues. Um, what we're trying to do to, to, to make that value proposition real is really investing in the service. We have been uh, replacing all the buses. Uh, so virtually all of the buses in the Muni fleet will have been replaced with small exception by the end of 2019. We will have gone from having one of the oldest fleets in the country to having one of the newest and more reliable fleets. We are investing in making changes in the streets of San Francisco to improve reliability on Muni and reduce delays. So that's things uh, like having the buses talk to the traffic signal so the traffic signals hold the green light so that the bus can get through. It's things like uh, adding turn lanes so that the Muni buses don't get stuck behind a car that's waiting to turn to make a turn off of the Muni route. Uh, it's things like widening the sidewalks where the bus stops are so the bus doesn't have to come out of traffic and then fight its way to get into traffic. Put, put it, putting all those things together makes the Muni service better, makes it a better option for more people for more trips. While we can't compete with the venture capital funding that uh, some of these other kinds of companies have and, and uh, the lack of regulations that they have, we have very high safety standards that we want and have to adhere to. Uh, we're trying to make that Muni ride a better option for more people for more trips. And I think the, the ridership trends show that, that we're achieving that at least somewhat. Okay. Well, we've also uh, been asking questions online via social media, and we have uh, received a bunch leading up to today, and here are some of these. Uh, coming from our email, we are, are we planning to extend the central subway into uh, north, into Fisherman's Wharf? Also, would it be a part of the plan to get the E Embarcadero out to Fort Mason? So uh, we're looking at both of those things. The, as I said, the central subway, which is really phase two of the T-3rd light rail project, the, the first phase was bringing it from Sunnydale uh, essentially up to the ballpark, and that was completed in 2007. The second phase, as I said, will be completed at the end of 2019, and that's extending the T uh, up fourth and then down underground, under fourth and under Stockton to Chinatown. Uh, we have started a planning process for a third phase that would extend it further, potentially up to Fisherman's Wharf. There's a lot of uh, demand. There's a lot of interest in North Beach now mm -hmm. for a station, and there's a lot of interest from Fisherman's Wharf, from Pier 39, from the community up there to see a further extension that would allow folks to get a single seat ride from Sunnydale through Bayview, Dogpatch, Mission Bay, through where the convention center is, up through the center of town, Chinatown, uh, all the way up to the, the northern waterfront. So that's something we're looking at. We did a, a feasibility study a number of years ago. It, to do that would, would not be an, an expensive project. It's on the order of uh, probably at the low end, a half a billion dollars. Uh, but we do expect when the central subway opens, it'll be from day one our highest ridership line. 
And I, I think that will build even more support and possibly momentum for a, a northern extension. So that, that's something we're doing early planning on. Likewise, uh, we're doing some early planning. Uh, we just recently started evaluating an alternative concept uh, for getting uh, to Fort Mason that might be simpler than, than the, the current concept that's been on the table. So that's something that we are going to be exploring uh, in this next two years as well. Okay. Well, coming from Twitter, our next question, uh, is there a line item for subway station improvements? Uh, they're saying the Civic Center and the Embarcadero station lighting looks like a funeral home. Yeah, so that's, uh, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I, I certainly hear the criticism. Um, it's something, <clears throat> uh, those stations are stations that are jointly uh, managed by Muni and BART, and uh, focusing on the stations is, is an area uh, that we're interested in. I, I will say that the needs of the transit system alone are, are significant. If you look at all the assets of the transit system, uh, we talked about the fleet, which is getting upgraded, the buses and trains. Uh, but if you look at the, the buildings that we operate from, like the green facility that you work out of, if you look at all the rail and the overhead lines and the signals and the switches, um, and then you add in the rest of the agency's assets, the parking meters, the, the traffic signals, uh, we have a lot of assets to maintain. We do prioritize those that are uh, most mission critical, the ones that are most related to delivering muni service, such as the rails, the buses, the, the overhead lines. And that does sometimes tend to leave the stations in kind of a, a second tier. Uh, but that said, we have been working uh, both at our own stations and with BART uh, to try to invest in the stations. Uh, BART has identified some funding uh, to start some work. They've even done some preliminary work. Folks may have seen, I think they've started to do a little bit of work at PAL. There, are, there is some station master planning that's happening. To the extent that we can identify funds, we'll continue to, imp to work to improve the environment of those stations. We are focusing with BART on elevators and escalators. We put that in the top tier, uh, but the aesthetics of the station matter, and that's where our riders spend time, and, and we, we want and would like to be able to make those investments as well. Okay, well, also coming from Twitter, can we make cable cars prepaid immediately and expand Clipper and Muni mobile sales at the same time? A cash surge would be one way to phase it and if necessary. Yeah, so I think what this uh, tweeter is referring to is a direction from the SFMTA board to, to get there, but to do it by, I think what we had proposed was to do it in about a year and a half. So this person is challenging us to accelerate that. Um, we we want to, and, and we, we share the goal of essentially getting the cash off the cable cars. One of the things that we are contemplating in this budget is uh, making a, a very large differential between folks who are using Clipper or Muni Mobile versus those who are paying cash. And this is mostly tourists, and we think the majority of tourists have smartphones, have the ability uh, to, to not need to use cash and to prepay, as this per person is suggesting. So we're thinking about making a very large cash dip differential exactly as they're suggesting. Uh, we do, though, want to make sure that we're doing outreach uh, so that folks know and that people don't one day show up and find out that they can't get on the cable car when they expect it to. And it's, it, while it, it, the cable cars do serve tourists, they do serve San Franciscans as well, and we don't want to catch anyone off guard. So we will be using the cash incentive that this person is suggesting, but we want to make sure we do the right outreach uh, so that everyone can be prepared and not be surprised and not get turned away from our wonderful cable cars. Also coming from Twitter, why are Clipper readers broken, outdated on newly purchased buses? So our, our Clipper reader uptime is actually pretty good. And uh, as someone who rides the bus uh, every, or train every day and is tagging my Clipper card every day, I, I would say I don't, I don't come across very many that aren't functioning. Uh, but that said, that they are pretty old technology, and we don't have new Clipper readers. So even when we get new buses and new trains, uh, we're basically recycling these old Clipper readers. So it is something that we are looking at whether there's an opportunity to modernize those. Mm -hmm. uh, but we get the buses new, and then in some cases we put some, some old equipment on because that's all we have, and that's the case with Clipper readers. Okay. 
Okay, so we have, uh, let's get started on some a few new questions. Uh, Ramesha on Twitter, can we have accurate GPS predictions for bus arrival on the next Muni app? Yeah, I know that's a, a source of frustration, and, and I'll, I'll admit, I didn't appreciate how important these bus arrival times were to people until a point last year where we had a, a, big, a bit, bit of a meltdown on that system and we had no predictions uh, and boy did we hear it and, and justifiably so. So we, we get how important that is to folks. Uh, this is another system of ours that's relying somewhat on old technology. Uh, we're gonna actually be going to a committee of our board later this month uh, to share our plans for the next generation of the system which will get us to a yes to the answer to that question of getting accurate arrival times. I'd say by and large, except if you're at the terminals uh, or close to the terminals, the, the predictions are, are pretty good uh, most of the time, but I know when, when it's off it can be very frustrating for folks. So we are, we are doing our best to, to move so that we can answer that question as yes. Okay, all right. Our next question comes from at Andrew K. Davidson. Does the budget provide for additional parking officers to deal with the number of vehicles parked in bike lanes? So um, that's something that we can contemplate. Our, our, we did in the last budget cycle, I think, add parking control officers uh, to the agency. Um, if we were gonna wanna try to add some more, uh, it's something that we would have to find the funds to pay for. We have though been uh, trying to focus their efforts in line with our Vision Zero policies um, on things like double parking in bike lanes because we understand and, and as someone who often gets around the city on a bicycle understand that when someone is double parked in a bike lane what, what we mostly do if we're riding a bike is we swerve out to go around it and that's putting us and the people who are driving particularly bus, muni bus drivers right. in, in a bad situation. Uh, so uh, we don't want that. So we have been focusing our efforts on double parking. We've been focusing on other behaviors such as blocking intersections, mm -hmm. which can also cause uh, unsafe behaviors. Uh, so while uh, it's an open question as to whether we can afford to add more parking control officers, but we're trying to more and more really focus them on enforcement uh, that's linked to safety. Okay, okay, very good. Next, from at Amy Ott Ottinger 415, the new trains are too few and far in between. What is the timeline for getting the trains in service? Yeah, well, it sounds like a vote of confidence for the, <laughs> for the new trains from the 415. So we should, uh, I think I mentioned this before, we mm. should have uh, 24 of them in place by late summer, early fall. So to, right now, just to give us a sense of perspective, we have about 150 of the old trains. So adding 24 new ones just this year, that's gonna be a, a noticeable percentage of the fleet. So it won't be a where's Waldo trying to find one of these new trains. You'll be seeing them more and more. And then by the end of next year, we'll have a total of 64 in service, as well as four additional ones that we'll use to service the events at the new Golden State Warriors Arena, your, your team. So. Um, you'll be seeing a, a lot more of them soon. Starting uh, this month, we should be adding almost one every week okay. to the fleet. So um, you'll be seeing a lot more of them out there. Coming from at Shugman Jane, uh, we would love to. We would love the to un, the underground to be from the end to be between Church and Noe by DeBose Park. Can you make that happen? Well, I probably have to, if I'm gonna answer that honestly, I think that's gonna be a no. I mean, it would be great if we didn't have to come out of that portal. Uh, we actually just redid that whole area a couple of years ago to at least get the, the rails and the overhead wires in good shape to put a modern signal systems to help smooth the path through the portal. But, mm -hmm. but as you know, having operated and now managing that service, the portals are definitely bottlenecks. So if we were able to keep that uh, train underground uh, through the, to the Sunset Tunnel, by DeBose Park, that would be great. But uh, we're trying to, we need to prioritize our funds to where, uh, first of all, we don't even have the funds to do that, but to the extent we did, we need to prioritize where we can meet uh, the greatest amounts of demand. We will be adding service to the end. We'll, mm -hmm. be, we'll be running hopefully three car trains before long. So we'll be adding capacity, uh, but we just don't have the, the funds to be able to do 
that level of undergrounding that uh, I totally agree with the writer would be a great thing for us to do. Okay, what is the future of San Francisco taxi industry? So that's, that's a tough question. Obviously, the, the transportation network companies, the TNCs, the Uber and Lyft, have uh, eaten, eaten quite a bit into the taxi market. Um, we still see the taxis as a, a critically important and integral part of transportation in San Francisco. They are great complements to Muni Transit Service. Uh, there are great ways, maybe you, you take Muni uh, one part of your trip, but you're coming home late at night or going a, a way that, that isn't, doesn't make for a good Muni trip. Uh, taxis are, are one way to make you be able to make that round trip without needing to, to get in your own car. Something that a lot of people don't uh, know or may not know is that taxis also provide a big part of our paratransit service. Mm -hmm. That's the service uh, for people with disabilities who can't use the, the regular fixed route muni service. So for that reason also, taxis are very important to transportation in San Francisco. So we're trying to do what we can to essentially level, level the playing field. I mentioned before, Uber and Lyft operate essentially without regulations, and yet for purposes of safety and accessibility and equity, we pile lots of regulations onto our taxi service that, that we regulate locally the TNCs are regulated by the state. Uh, so what we've been trying to do is uh, level that playing field by making sure that our regulations are really just the essential ones needed for critical safety, accessibility, equity purposes, um, and to do our best to support the industry. They, they have use of the most of the red lanes in the city, so they have some competitive advantages um, that we think will keep them strong or at least keep them on stable footing so that they can continue into the future to provide the critical service they do, especially for our people with disabilities. Okay. Our next question comes from the Hayes Valley Association. Are you planning for improved lighting for pedestrians in the Hayes Valley area? So, so one thing that we are finding as we're advancing our Vision Zero efforts is that uh, one of the factors of safety, and it's one that really hasn't traditionally been in our toolkit or even really the city's toolkit, is lighting. Um, the, the National Governor Safety Association just uh, this week came out with a number of uh, recommendations and improved pedestrian lighting w was one of them. And I think that's probably the point that they're making in Hayes Valley. Uh, right now, uh, street lighting is managed by the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. They traditionally have not been funded for pedestrian level lighting. It's something that we in the city, through our city's capital planning process and, and other forums, have been working to collectively identify a way that we can fund pedestrian lighting, particularly uh, where it can advance our safety efforts. So we'll continue to work with the P PUC and the rest of the city to try to get that one to also be a yes, so that we can provide lighting in Hayes Valley and other neighborhoods, especially where there's heavy pedestrian traffic at night. Well, coming from uh, our email, does your budget include cleaning and maintaining your parking garages? Uh, the fifth emission garage is always dirty, machines malfunctioning, and why so many vacant storefronts on the street level? Yeah, so that's uh, a lot of questions, uh, all of them good. <laughs> so uh, we contract out the management of our parking garages to uh, private sector companies that have that expertise to manage parking. Um, we do have standards of safety and cleanliness that we should be holding them to, and it sounds like maybe we have some work to do at Fifth and Mission. Uh, with regard to the equipment, we are in a process now, we, we've done, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four garages where we're replacing that equipment and putting in more modern equipment that will be uh, more reliable, um, that will reduce the operating costs for some of these operators that will let them uh, redirect those costs to enhance security and cleaning. So uh, we might not be exactly where we need to be today, but uh, we're in the process of changing out that equipment as we speak. I think the Civic Center garage right across the street there uh, from here is under con is happening right now. Uh, with regard to the storefronts, uh, we, we've recently brought in some uh, retail uh, brokerage experts to help us get those spaces filled. I, I know it drives me crazy to, to go down Mission and see all those empty storefronts. I will say that, uh, as everybody knows, retail is, is, is having a bit of a challenge time these days because people are 
going online instead of going down to their neighborhood retail. So everybody should shop at your neighborhood yes. retail and, and shop at brick and mortar stores in the city. Uh, but even with the changes in real retail, we are working hard to get those spaces filled. All right. Our next question is coming from Chris on Facebook. What about giving real tickets to those parked in a bus stop, meaning pressing those camera buttons and following up? Yeah, so um, what, the, what the writer is referring to is that we have forward-facing cameras on our buses, and uh, we can use them to write certain kinds of tickets. Um, that authority to write certain kinds of tickets is granted by the state legislature, and right now it, they've only authorized us to write those tickets for people who are parked in a transit only lane. So it doesn't, we can't use those for people parked in bus stops unless the bus stop happens to be in a transit only lane. A couple of years ago, we sought legislative authority up in Sacramento to expand uh, so that we would be able to write those tickets in bus stops, that we did not get the support of the legislature to do so. Uh, so for the time being, we need to rely on parking control officers, on transit supervisors, um, taxi investigators now are empowered to write those. Uh, so we have a number of different folks within the agency as well as the police department who can write those tickets, but we still have to do it the old fashioned way unless we can get state law changed. Okay. Well, Chris, I can tell you that uh, my coworkers often write tickets. We write tickets all day. <laughs> we thank you for that. <laughs> And that's an expensive ticket, it right? Is. It Parking is. Parking in a bus yes. zone, I think, is more than $250. It is. So it is. we don't want to be writing tickets. We want people to not be stopping in our bus zones. Right, right. Okay, this one's coming from our email. Will you reinstate Sunday parking meter operation to help fund Muni's budget? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is that the institution of parking management on Sundays through enforcement of the meters was never meant to be uh, was never done for budget purposes. It was done because we know from exhaustive research we've done here in San Francisco and elsewhere in the world um, that when you manage parking, it makes parking available and that you need to manage parking when there's demand for parking. And there's you know, just as much demand for parking for the most part on Sundays as there is on Saturdays. Um, and you know, getting back to supporting our local businesses and wanting retail to thrive in San Francisco, uh, we put in that, that in place to create parking availability so that when people go to that neighborhood commercial corridor on a Sunday afternoon, they can actually find a parking space mm -hmm. and, and can visit those merchants. Uh, obviously, there, there was a, a lot of controversy and dispute over that policy change, and we did end up reversing it. Uh, my board ha has raised the, the issue of looking again at times of day that we current don't man currently don't manage parking and exploring whether we should uh, do that. So um, I don't think we'll see any specific proposal for Sunday parking uh, reinstitution uh, this year, but our board is challenging us constantly to look at times and places where we're not managing parking, but maybe should be. Okay. Our next question comes from Twitter. What are the short-term safety improvements to the Embarcadero, and how can people use uh, this corridor to uh, contribute ideas and identify problem areas? So in terms of contributing ideas and identifying problems, you know, I would encourage people always to use 311, mm -hmm. um, which you can do by calling 311, you can do online, you can do through a Twitter direct message, you can do through the 311 app, lots of ways to connect in. Uh, we really take that feedback seriously, particularly if it's a, a safety issue. Uh, we are in the wrapping up an Embarcadero enhancement project and if somebody goes to our website and just uh, just uh, searches for Embarcadero you can find that and you can get information on some of what we're looking at as, as well as ways to participate. Uh, I will say that uh, we're working in conjunction with, conjunction with the Port of San Francisco that is looking at the possibility of rebuilding the seawall or the necessity to rebuild the seawall and we'll be asked seeking the voter support to do so this November. Depending on uh, what path they choose to do that it may require some disruption on the Embarcadero. So before we do any long-term plans on the Embarcadero, we wanna make sure we're not gonna be in conflict with the seawall project, but we're continually looking at whatever we can do in the short term. There's been some improvements we've made, uh, such as more uh, green paint on the Embarcadero, and we'll continue to do that. And we welcome folks to provide input on how we can make short-term changes while we wait for the, the better long-term changes that we've identified. Our next question uh, comes from email. 
There's always a long wait for the K trains during peak hours. I would like to see two car trains on all other on all other lines separate and separate into single cars and add more K service. Use money to resolve this issue. All right. Well, you might be able to answer this one better than I can, but. Um one of the things that, uh, so I mentioned that the, all these train cars we're adding, these 64 cars, this, this is expansion to the 150 we have today. So on lines like the KT and the J where you see one car trains today, you'll start seeing two car trains, start seeing more shuttles in the subway to deal with the, where the crowds are the biggest. And in some places where you see two car trains, you'll see three car trains. Also once the central subway goes into service at the end of 2019, we will go back to decoupling the K and the T, so the K will be its own line going back and forth, uh, which I think will help both the K and the T. And so we are using money to solve that. Adding 64 new rail cars is a big part of that. And as I said, we're gonna have to find money in the operating budget to support the addition of those trains. So we're doing just that. Okay. Tom from Twitter asked, what are you doing to plan for the future related to curb management as it relates to loading commuter buses, bikes, and autos? So, so that's a great forward-looking question from, from someone who knows a thing or two about transportation. Uh, really one of, the, one of the main tools we have to manage is the curb. Uh, we don't regulate every vehicle that's out on the streets. We don't regulate lots of the big buses in the city. Uh, we don't regulate the TNCs. We don't really regulate private cars except at the curb. So the, the curb will be key to the future of transportation, whether it's autonomous or not. So it's something that, that we've been studying a lot. We have uh, a number of folks in, in the agency who are focused on kind of rethinking how we manage the curb. We, we've already uh, done a number of different kinds of uh, pilots. We have the, had the commuter shutter, shuttle pilot that's now a program, which was a different way to manage the curb. We have on-street car sharing and on-street bike sharing. Uh, we're doing a lot uh, as people change how much they drive around the city and park uh, to shift more towards loading zones, both commercial loading and passenger loading. Uh, so it's a big question, not, not an easy answer, but there's a lot of planning and thinking going on and talking with other cities as well as how we change how we think about and manage the curb going into the future. Okay. Well, Tom uh, has been busy on Twitter. He also asked, as, uh, as development along Folsom, Rincon Hill, and the East cut increases, what investments are we making here to improve mass transit and bikes? Yeah, so um, th there, there's a, a lot to talk about there. Um, the increase in rail cars will give us more service on the Embarcadero, and when the end, car, when the end trains are three-car trains, that'll give more service there. Uh, we are, <clears throat> have been working with the mayor and supervisor, Kim, uh, for many years as Eastern Soma has been growing to uh, add more muni bus service into that area. And that's something that we'll be proposing as part of this budget. Uh, essentially, I think we'll be changing the route of the 12 so that it services that area. The second street uh, bike streetscape project will, uh, is underway right now and will provide good north-south connectivity in that area, um, there are bike improvements happening on Folsom and Harrison in that area. So in short, there's a lot of investment going on right now that uh, will be uh, changing and reconfiguring the streets to prioritize transit, to prioritize walking and biking, uh, because we know that those streets are seeing a lot of development and we need to prioritize these more efficient, sustainable modes of transportation. Okay, well at Gerald Chin, Asks, is it possible to add the all-day SF Muni Pass in onto Clipper? If not right away, is it possible to add the pass in the future instead of it just being available on um, Muni Mobile? Um, so in the future, yes. At present, no. And I don't know if that's fair. He's, he's a journalist. I don't ah. know if media is allowed in here. But <laughs> no, we welcome the question. I actually <laughs> see him riding the bus all the time. Um, the, the technology, I, I talked about some of our technology being old. Some of the oldest technology we have is our clipper, is the, the underlying clipper technology. Mm -hmm. um, we have been working, clip, the clipper program is managed on, on a regional level by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is a regional transportation and planning organization working with all of the different transit agencies. 
And we have been working uh, for a number of years to modernize the, the whole Clipper system. The, the current schedule would have that modernization happening, uh, probably uh, not for another two or three years, best case. Mm -hmm. And until that modernization happens, we won't be able to make these kind of changes, such as the all-day pass. So whereas we would love to get all these products on Muni Mobile and on Clipper, uh, the technology just isn't there to support it. So we're using what we have. We have Muni Mobile today, and um, we want to continue uh, to, to use that as kind of a stopgap measure to bring in new fare products like the Day Pass. But as, as soon as we can get it on Clipper, absolutely, that would be the idea. So uh, we have, what are the best ways to advocate for safety in my neighborhood? That's a great question. There, there are a lot of ways. I think if, if there are spot issues, uh, meaning there's, there's an intersection that's problematic or, or there's a, a crosswalk that, that needs to be restriped, uh, those kind of spot issues, again, use 311. Uh, 311 is where we're able to get a lot of information from the public. Um, and we send folks out when we get those issues, and particularly if they're safety issues, and evaluate and try to address them. Uh, more generally, um, the, there are many organized community groups in San Francisco, and we participate <clears throat> in a lot of those meetings. Uh, so participating in your local neighborhood group, whether, whether it's a merchant group or a community group, um, is a good way to, to get your voice into the conversation. There are advocacy groups that spend their time, um, such as Walk San Francisco, specifically advocating for improvements in safety in our streets. So participating with a group like that uh, is another way. Um, there's uh, the MTA board and other public meetings that we hold are other forums in which people can, can communicate. And they can always just uh, go to our website. There's a lot of information there and a lot of ways for, for people to to provide their input, but we, we really want people in our neighborhoods to be active advocates for safety in their neighborhoods. Uh, they often know better than we do what the issues are and maybe what some of the solutions are. So strongly encourage people to, to get involved in, in any way they can that works with their schedule. Okay. Well, I think this will be the, the easiest question for you to answer of the night. What are the different color uh, on the curves for? Okay, yeah, that one, uh, I, I, think I, I think I know that one. <laughs> Uh, so the white is for passenger loading, the yellow is for commercial loading, um, the blue is for handicap parking only, uh, and that for that you need a handicap placard or handicap uh, license plate, um, and the red uh, means uh, no parking and generally means no stopping. So our muni zones, for example, are red zones, so don't stop in a muni zone. Oh. And this will be our last question. When, when else can I make comments on the budget? So uh, the, the time is, is really now. So go to sfmta.com slash budget. Um, to, uh, and there's information there in terms of um, being able to submit comments. Uh, the MTA board will be holding another public hearing. And that will be in two weeks on Tuesday, March the 30th, uh, March, the, sorry, March the 20th, that the meeting starts at 1 p.m. here at City Hall. Um, but uh, between now and then, people are, you know, should feel free to email. Um, uh, from that point forward, the next time we'll be at the board is, I believe, on April 3rd, also 1 p.m. here at City Hall. Um, but by then, we will have really developed our budget. So would really encourage folks who have ideas uh, to use Twitter, to use Facebook, to use email, visit our website, come show up at the MTA board meeting on March 20th so that we can capture all that feedback, incorporate as much of it as we can, um, and then bring a balanced budget to the board in April. Very good. Well, Ed, I certainly learned a lot. Thank you, and thanks to everyone who chimed in with questions or watched to learn more. The conversation continues as we get more budget-related events coming up. Check sfmta.com for more information on the process. And we all thank you for watching. And thank you very much for doing this. I know thank this is not your day job. You have a much harder <laughs> day job than this. Um, that, but we're very appreciative of your service every day. And thanks very much for, for doing this and for giving us the opportunity. And for everyone who participated, watched, wrote in, emailed, uh, or is getting that email 
or tweet ready. Thank you very much for, for joining. Thank you. Okay, oh, one last question here. The only budget details provided so far relate to fares. How can the public comment on transit service change proposals that have not been uh, written yet? Uh, subway service cannot be increased at peak times due to subway. Let's see. Yeah, so, so I think I, I, I get where that question is coming from. So uh, the, we're finalizing some proposed service changes, and, mm -hmm. and we'll be presenting them to the board in two weeks. We'll be making them public before that. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll try to get them out as, as soon as possible, so there's time for the public uh, to weigh in on those. Um, in terms of the, the subway being at capacity, and again, you could probably answer this one better than I can, uh, there actually is uh, still capacity in the subway. Uh, we talked about going from one car trains to two car trains two to three, um, and adding more shuttle service. So we're, we may be close to capacity, but we can add more, and, and we'll be working to do so. Again, we appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Have a good night. Thank you.